I've seen so many entrepreneurs start other things and they do often fail, but don't let that failure be in vain. Take that and learn so that you can be better. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden, and we are here with the Kara Golden Show this morning. So excited to have Brian Scudamore with us today. He is the founder and CEO of a company called O2E Brands, and he also has a brand new book coming out shortly uh, called BYOB. We will talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. But in case you are not familiar with O2E Brands, you may be familiar with with Brian's uh, kind of... I call it his flagship brand. Um, I don't know if that's fair or not, but 1-800-GOT-JUNK, which was just an incredible story uh, that I'm so excited to have him here to share a little bit more about the journey and lessons and all those things. Mm. He's also uh, a creator of some other brands, including Wow One Day Painting and Shack Shine. And uh, as you can tell, he's a serial entrepreneur, uh, definitely a successful one. But as we always talk about, there's always hard stuff that goes on mm. that that uh, especially when you're coming into the entrepreneur world, do you think that people like Brian just snap their fingers and it all just happens and it's all pretty and great. Mm. <laughs> so we're here today to talk more about uh, Brian and the journey and welcome. So excited to have you here, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Kara. Glad to be here. Always love talking about business and lessons learned and failures and all that fun stuff. It really is fun. Super awesome. So for those who aren't familiar uh, with O2E, what what does O2E stand for? Yeah, it's, it's my parent company for the three brands that we have, uh, all home service brands. It stands for Ordinary to Exceptional. We are in the business of making ordinary businesses like junk removal exceptional through customer experience. And we've gone on to do it with Wow One Day Painting and Shack Shine and two other areas that are very fragmented mom and pop type businesses that need some brand and need some uh, national footprint building. And, and we love what we do. I love it. So let's go back to the beginning. So Brian and junk. Like, was that, were there, was there any connection there? Did you always know? Did you, did you go to the junkyards? Did you, I mean, like, who were you as a kid? Yeah, as a kid, my grandparents were entrepreneurs. They owned an army surplus store in San Francisco where I was born. I'm, I'm Canadian and I'm, I've been raised mostly in Canada, but I remember going to their army surplus store and just being in love with the game of business, ringing the cash register, helping customers. It wasn't junk removal that ever attracted me to business. It was my grandparents. They lit a, a spark in me. Um, it is funny though, when my, when my grandmother passed away, I found a, a binder that she kept of drawings that I used to do as a kid. And there's one of me, a self portrait at four and a half years old, where I actually did draw myself sweeping up junk at the side of a street with a blue truck behind me, uh. which my first truck was blue. I mean, I don't know how these things happen, maybe a little serendipity, but yeah, there was some past history there. Those those things, those little finds are gold. Uh, they are. You know, they it's are. it's funny. I, I've talked before in my podcast about my son Keenan. He's nineteen and mm. loves uh, restoring old cars. And uh, I I laugh about the junkyard comment, but he actually loves going to these junkyards and he finds you know little parts for mm. BMWs and Mercedes, and he's got a whole thing going on on eBay because. Right. It, they're all the hard things because you really can find some, you know, gold uh, in uh, in sure. there. So um, definitely pretty, pretty interesting. So you founded 1-800-GOT-JUNK when you were 19 years old with mm -hmm. $700. I mean, mm -hmm. how like what were the first steps? I mean, tell go back to that beginning kind of story yeah. thinking, all of that. Yeah, my company was called the Rubbish Boys at the time. It was just myself, but I had a vision for something bigger. So the Rubbish Boys, I bought a beat up old pickup truck, a Ford F100 and painted 738 junk, my phone number on the side. And it was really just a way to pay for college. I was a university kid and I was learning about business and 
ironically, what funded my college education, that truck, I started learning more about business by running one versus studying in school. And I made a decision to drop out and go all in. And with a year left in my college education, I sat down with my father, who's a liver transplant surgeon, who believes in higher education, of course. And I said, I'm, I'm dropping out. I'm doing this full time. And he didn't agree. He thought I was crazy to leave school to become a full time junk man. But I knew that I was going to build something. So when you talk about what were those first steps, the first steps really started by me dropping out of school. By me making a commitment that this isn't just a little side hustle that's going to pay for college. This is a real business and I'm going to show my dad and myself that I can do this. And I incorporated the company. I bought a second truck and I started to build a team of people. But uh, it's interesting because that first team of people was not the right team. I ended up firing my entire company five years in. Um, 1994, I had 11 employees, one bad apple, they say spoils the whole bunch. I probably had nine bad apples of that 11 person labor force. And I sat down and I, I said, I'm sorry, but this isn't working out. I've let you down as a leader. I haven't found the right people or given you the love and support that you need to be successful. And I made a change and I started my company again. And I knew that day it was all about finding the right people and treating them right. So what were the signals for you? I mean, let's let's jump into that. Mm. What that you I mean, whether it started with yourself or whether it started mm. with the team. I mean, was you mentioned one bad mm. apple there. Mm. Like what was kind of the the core thing that you saw? I wasn't having fun. Mm -hmm. I, I stopped having fun. To me, I mentioned my grandparents and this this game of business. It was no longer an exciting game. It was a frustrating game of showing up every day with people that I didn't enjoy working with. Hmm. And these were people that were very glass, half, half, half empty. They didn't see the world in an optimistic way filled with possibility. They just had complaints. Nothing was right. They didn't like their customers. And I didn't enjoy spending time with them. So hmm. I had to pick new players. And ultimately, it was my fault as the leader. I brought on those people. I made the wrong choices, but I got to learn that a company is only as strong as the people behind it. And if you don't have an optimistic, happy group of people that you're building a business with, why would customers ever turn to you? So interesting. So did you take a break in between? Like, did you a few months before not rebuilding? A, not a minute, not a hmm. minute. I literally fired everybody. And then that day went out and did as many jobs as I could. I serviced customers by myself. And then I put ads in the paper trying to recruit new people. Hmm. And this time I was very, very careful. I was selective to choose people that I wanted to work with who had the same values. Uh, we call it today the beer and barbecue test. When we interview people, would we have a beer with that person? Or maybe mm -hmm. we'd have a hint with them, but it's something, whatever we're going to drink right. with that person, do we feel good about having a conversation with them. Are they interesting, interested? Are they good people? And then the barbecue test is how do they fit in with the whole big picture of the company? Lots of diversity, lots of different opinions, but do they somehow fit and gel? Uh, are they making us better by joining our company? So interesting. It's, uh, I mean, that must have taken a lot of courage actually to, to do that. It did, but I, I was fed up. I was, I, I had enough. I really was hiding in my private office. We don't have private offices today. We've got <laughs> two big offices, 300 people apiece. Everybody uh, would sit out in the open. But back then I would hide and I just didn't want to be around these people. They weren't my people. Yeah. Um, could I have coached them and developed them if I was a better leader and more experienced at the time? Maybe. I just don't know if they saw what I saw. And I saw pure possibility in building a brand. We were going to build the FedEx of junk removal with clean, shiny trucks, friendly, uniform drivers, transforming an industry in the same way that you built a category. We built a category in a way that had never been done. So it's so, so interesting. I, I'm, I'm thinking a lot as, as you're talking for sure. It's, it's really, really mm -hmm. interesting. So going back to, you know, you started with $700. What was the mm -hmm. business model back then? I mean, you're, you're picking mm -hmm. up um, from mm -hmm. people's homes or uh, m businesses or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So you're charging um, mm -hmm. there. And then, so was it a, 
always then would you actually sell those things too? No. And so, no, no. The, so the, the model is the same today as it actually was 33 years ago. We take away someone's pile of junk from their garage or inside their basement, wherever it might be, old furniture, yard debris, remodeling refuse. We haul it off to be donated, recycled or disposed of. And we charge by volume. And that model has not changed. Our prices have increased, inflation and so on. But uh, our service offering and the way we provide it has has changed and innovated. But yeah, it's never been about selling the material. It hasn't been about, oh, there's great stuff there we can put on eBay. This is junk that people want to get rid of that they don't have the space for and they might not have a truck or the time to drive it to the dump. And uh, everyone's got junk and we've made it easy. They just point and junk disappears and it's been a great service. That's incredible. So one of the things that I talk a lot about uh, to entrepreneurs is I remember when we were starting to grow Hint, I thought, okay, the minute that Coke or Pepsi launches a knockoff product, I'm dead, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. instead, what I realized and what I tell people today is you can't control what other people are going to do. I'm sure Mm -hmm. you had people who you created this category. Mm -hmm. Uh, You had probably knockoffs that came along. And so what are your thoughts on, on that as well? Like, how do you stay the best, right? Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate Mm -hmm. yourself as you've got competition coming in? I've tried to put my ego aside and say, okay, I'm not hurt that somebody's mimicking us they say that it's the finest form of flattery and all that stuff which is still hard to you don't like seeing somebody duplicate exactly what you're doing you want them to be creative and do things differently but we're always looking for what is someone doing better we befriend the competition we always have so we do a daily stand-up huddle meeting in our office and we've been known to bring in competitors and say hey why don't you come in for a huddle and they come in and they're amongst 300 people that are all building this business and We talk to them and we find out what they're doing better and what we can learn from and they share ideas with us. So we befriend the competition. We get them on our on on our side and us on theirs. And we're building a brand that in a space that needs more competition. So I've always welcomed the competition and said, great, come on into our space. FedEx would not have become what they are today without UPS, McDonald's and Burger King. You need a big player. And so sometimes it's just talking about it more and hoping that you inspire someone to give you a run for your money. But the key is, how do you stay on top and stay the best? And we're competitive. We always want to do our best. And so it's always learning from watching others. Interesting. So your motto is, it's all about the people. Uh, Mm -hmm. You're a franchise, you have franchise partners. I've never been in the franchise business. I think Mm -hmm. for, for me, I've always been fascinated. I've talked to Ali Webb, who have founded Dry Bar and uh, Mm -hmm. many other franchise owners, um, too, who have shared, you know, their thoughts on the franchises. But how do you keep your brand intact and all the things that you're talking about culturally and and when you're Mm -hmm. dealing with franchises that Mm -hmm. are, you know, basically supposed to do the same thing that you're doing? Well, it comes down to a couple of things. One, you already mentioned mentioned it's all about people. We've got to find, just like we would employees, the right franchise owners. They have to culturally fit with us and how we do things. If we can tell them this is the way we do it, but if they don't go out there and actually deliver that, then we fail. So preserving the brand, I'd always loved, not necessarily McDonald's food, but the McDonald's brand of how iconic and how careful they were to preserve their core of everything they did. When Ray Kroc built that out, it was all about systems. We've done the same, the right processes and systems where we inspect what we expect. We make sure that what we're asking people to deliver, that they are delivering. We make sure we story tell and help course correct and let people know, here's why this is so important that everything looks or behaves this way. And we get their buy-in, but it starts with the right people who culturally believe that this is not a business that's just about making money. It's a business about changing lives, growing and developing our people, giving them opportunity, building a brand that customers love. And so it's, it takes a lot of hard work. It isn't easy to preserve as a franchise or to keep everything the same and consistent, 
but you'll get difference of opinions. And that's where you ask your franchise partners, well, what would be the best way and why? And how do we challenge the status quo and continue to change things for the betterment of the whole system and the customer? How many franchises do you have? We have about 250 Amazing. across 1-800-GOT-JUNK, WOW, One Day Painting, and Shack Shine. And it's the, the coolest thing about franchising for us is that you really, you know, I'm wearing this hat today. I always wear different hats. This one is bigger and better together. I love it. We are building as a franchise or something bigger and better together. We couldn't grow and build and scale 1-800-GOT-JUNK or WOW One Day if we didn't have all the innovative ideas of our people, mm-hmm. our franchise partners saying, this isn't working. This is broken. Here's a better way. And we take that that sort of innovation and test it in the system. And we see, okay, if this works, let's share it with the whole Wow One Day family. And it does make things bigger and better for everybody. That's incredible. So let's talk about your other businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, the You mentioned Wow One Day painting and shack shine. Mm-hmm. So it seems like natural extensions, uh, Mm -hmm. definitely dealing with um, the home and some capacity. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which one was first and how Mm -hmm. are those businesses growing? Yeah, we were 22 years into 1-800-GOT-JUNK before I discovered this indoor house painting in a day concept. I was looking to have my house painted. I was... uh, I brought three people in to give me estimates. And the first two, they had cigarettes hanging out of their mouth. They were uh, showed up late. They weren't uniformed. They were exactly what I expected in that space. But the third person comes in professional, uniform, clean cut, shiny van, great brand. And he said, listen, I'll paint your house in a day. Same price as everyone else. Quality as good, if not better. And I got really excited about that one day concept. I said, how is that even possible? And I came home at 6.30 p.m., floor to ceiling, moldings, trim, everything. It was immaculate. And and I walked in. I was like, wow. And that became the company name of the company that we acquired. And it's simple. I mean, everyone knows you can paint one room in a day. Well, if it's a big room, you might have to put two people in that room. So if you've got eight rooms, you put in 10 to 16 people. It's just coordinated, planned execution. The quality doesn't suffer. If anything, we've got a quality assurance person that walks around at the end of the day to make sure it's all great. It's even better. And so we've been able to transform in the same way we created a category with junk removal. We created this one day painting concept. Wow, one day painting. And it's it's changing the world. It's attracting franchise owners, people that come to the table that go, I've always wanted to run a business, but I don't have the idea. Franchising often appeals to people because they go, I don't need to invent an idea. I mean, I know your story a little bit and how you came across Hint and and that there was just a need and you discovered, you know, making your own water and putting fresh fruit in. Most people don't do that. You and I have created unique categories. Most people go, ah, what's my idea? And they don't find that moment of serendipitous kind of luck or whatever it might be. So sometimes franchising is, is the ticket. Yeah, definitely. And how about the Shack Shine? Yeah. So Shack Shine, uh, same thing, was looking to get my gutters done. Uh, my wife does not let me call for home services anymore because she worries I'm going to start another company and I, I don't need to be <laughs> any busier. Uh, but Shack Shine, I needed my gutters done and I had a guy come by and I was so impressed with him after trying to find someone reliable to come by and wasn't having much luck. And he was creating this this brand called Shack Shine. The logo, the look and feel, we rebranded uh, after we acquired the company. But it was really just about professionalizing this home detailing space. Someone gets their house or sorry, their car detailed. Why don't you get your house detailed? And I love it. The 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 windows, the gutters, the power washing, and we even do Christmas lights. It's been a, a fun business and um, it was very needed the, that nobody nobody can really think of a brand in that space. And we're hoping to change that where one day everybody just immediately like 1-800-GOT-JUNK. They go, oh, shock shine. That's it. That sounds great. Are those as broadly um, dispersed yeah. at those companies as well, or are they? Yeah, just- they're the you know one is the little baby in the family, and one's kind of the uh, the 
you know, grade school kid that's that's growing up. And so Wow One Day Painting has about 60 franchise partners, uh, Shack Shine a little less. And they are uh, they're across North America, but we've got this massive footprint to build. You know, we might have 20 percent penetration in a market that has uh, uh, a lot of room for us to grow and expand. So that's where we always look for great people and finding the right entrepreneurial idea, along with someone who's looking to build a business and needs a proven recipe is, is really the opportunity. I love it. So Brian, I, I always ask our guests to share a story about a challenge or a mm. failure that you've had in your journey, uh, yeah. somewhere along the way. And I, I'd, I'd love to hear that story. And ultimately what, what did you learn from it? Mm-hmm. And, uh, maybe that surprised you. I mean, you've told us a yeah. few different nuggets already, sure. but if you've, yeah. if you've got any others in your back pocket, that would be awesome. Yeah, no, I, I was sort of like, okay, deep breath. Uh, you know, I, I've got a good story for you, and it certainly evokes some emotion and pain. But it's uh, it's a good story that I learned a lot from, and and I do believe I'll, I'll start by saying failure is a gift. If you can choose to unwrap that failure and go, what did I learn? How does it make me better? What new opportunity that could be bigger and better will result? I wrote a book called WTF, Willing to Fail. It's okay to make mistakes. Unwrap that gift and allows you to make make you better. So my one of my biggest failures and one that um, I mentioned, we've got three brands. We used to have four. Uh, so there, here's the failure. Uh, we had a moving company called You Move Me. Eight years of running that business, an amazing brand and logo and look and feel. We tried to transform the moving space. Moving is hard. Whenever you and I, anyone has ever moved, does anyone love it? I mean, it might be exciting to move to a new place, but it's a pain in the butt for so long. Unpacking, you lose stuff, stuff's broken. It's just, it's tough. No matter how amazing the movers are, how great the service is, we were finding that customers still go, oh, I'm tired. Mom and dad are fighting, you know, like it, it's just, it's a hard experience. So we tried to make a space. Uh, we tried to take all our happy businesses and all the learnings from them and do the same thing to moving and realized after eight years, we couldn't do it. When you haul away your junk, you go, oh, what a relief. When you paint your home, you're like, look at beautiful transformation. When you clean your windows, oh, I can see through them. When you move, you're like, okay, the movers are gone and now the real work starts. So we sold the business, got out and realized that, um, Our ego took a bit of a hit in the sense that, you know, we thought we could do this, but we couldn't. And we sold it to someone else that we thought could do it and still hasn't done it two years later. So it's it's a challenging commodity space. It's an hourly business. It's hard to find people that want to be a part of the moving business. And we gave up. But sometimes you, you sort of allow yourself permission to give up and know when it's time to give up and throw in the towel. And we moved on and put all our focus into the three brands we've got. And we realized it's about happy businesses and happy customers. And that's where we're, we're, we're sticking where we were at. And uh, that's our future. I love it. I think that having some days, I think it's courage. Some days I think it's experience, right? Mm-hmm. To be able yeah. to say, okay, we're, we're done. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, I think it's especially hard even for existing entrepreneurs because it, when you've done something successful, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's very rare that, uh, you don't have some failures after that great success, right? I, at least mm-hmm. in the beverage industry and in the food industry, I've seen multiple times where people will build incredible companies and then, mm-hmm. you know, they'll go start another one or they'll go mm-hmm. buy one and, mm-hmm. and maybe it, it's not working, but, you know, the key is to know when something's not working and shut it down, mm-hmm. right. Or sell it or whatever that is. Yeah. And to, to do that and then learn something from it so that when you do do it again, what would you do differently? I've seen so many entrepreneurs, as, as you've mentioned, too, you know, people start other things and they do often fail. But that is going to happen and be OK with it. But don't let that failure be in vain. Take that and learn so that you can be you can be better. Um, the other the other piece of learning on that was. We, in the beginning, took 25 of our most successful franchise owners with 1-800-GOT-JUNK and had them buy and operate Wow, uh, You Move Me franchises. And uh, a woman who is a great mentor and friend of mine, Dina Dwyer, who owns a big franchise or company called The Dwyer Group, she said to me, don't do it. 
And she explained why. She said, you're going to take their focus away from 1-800-GOT-JUNK. They're going to look to the new shiny object and both businesses will suffer. And she was right. And so to this day, we don't award franchises to people across multiple industries. We say, great, if you want to buy more WOW One Day painting franchises, great. You've you've proven you can do it. Go do more. But she was right. I called her up and told her she was right. We were wrong. And again, some learning. So valuable, uh, valuable lesson that she'd been through and experienced many times. And uh, so trusting mentors is an incredibly important part of my sort of journey. I love it. So you've got a new book coming out Mm -hmm. in April called BYOB, Build Your Own Business. And talk to me a bit about that book. Yeah. So BYOB stands for Build Your Own Business, Be Your Own Boss. There's sort of a couple motivations why many people choose entrepreneurship. Some want to be sort of king or queen and be in charge. Some want to just build because they like creating. And so what I do is I investigate over a conversation, almost like we're having a beer together, is what are the lessons I've learned in my 33 years? What have I seen and, and learned from and challenges and mistakes? And how can I help inspire someone to make the leap? So in a short, easy read, my goal is to have someone read that and go, okay, I see the options ahead of me. Here's what I might choose. And I talk about a friend of mine, Shaquille O'Neal, who is a franchisee. You know, here's a guy, and I didn't realize that till he spoke at our conference and did our keynote, and then he and I connected after, that he's built all these franchise companies as a franchisee. And what he did is he took what he learned from sports, playing the game, following the rules, building a team, leadership. He didn't invent the game of basketball. He got out there and played the game at an exceptional level. Same thing with his restaurants. He takes a proven recipe, puts a winning team into place, leads them, cheerleads them, invests in them, and off they grow. And so franchising is something that has uh, a need for a little more glamour, I think, and then realizing someone like Shaquille O'Neal and people have been successful in choosing a proven recipe uh, got me excited. And then some people want to do what you and I have done is start with a blank sheet and say, okay, I want to build it from the ground up. I want to invent, make mistakes, tweak, refine, deal with all the the good and the bad that comes with it. And so my book sort of has this conversation with someone as to the different paths and what fits someone's personality if they really want to take the leap. They say that 66% of Americans dream of starting their own business. So few actually do. You can, and it's not as hard as people think. And so the book's meant to give a shot of confidence to people to take the leap and and do it if they feel it really is right. I love it. Well, I cannot wait to read it. And it's available in pre-orders right now, right? Pretty soon. Pretty soon. I, I think that page is going live pretty soon. So yes, let's say awesome. yes. Well, we'll we'll be looking for it for sure. Oh, and oh, uh, this is incredible. You mentioned, by the way, you have a uh, a son. You were listening to my podcast on how yes. I built this, and yes. uh, which is amazing. And I have four uh, Gen Zers, as I say. I know yeah. a lot about Gen Z. I could write a book, I think, about uh, that yeah. generation and what they're looking for in the workforce going forward. But right. uh, what do you hope that your family is learning from your experiences? And I, mm. I feel like you know, for, for me, there's this roller coaster of starting a company. I mean, I heard you, you know, talk about shutting a company down. I mean, these, these kids are sponges, right? They watch all of this. And I think my, my family is going to be incredibly brave. I don't know if they're going to be entrepreneurs or not, but they are learning a lot of lessons along the way. And, and, um, I'm, I'm kind of hearing that from you too, but I'd love to hear your perspective on it. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So what would they get from me having seen my journey? I mean, I, I hope they would say, you know, my I've got three young kids. I, I hope they would say my dad loves what he does every day of it. And even when things are hard, he's still jazzed up to want to fix it and change the world. And he loves watching people grow. Um, I've never been a big money motivated person by any means. Um, what I love is watching others spend the money and grow and build lives for themselves and live the dream of ownership or building with us as intrapreneurs. 
Um, it's funny, I've never asked any one of my three kids and my oldest is going off to college next year. I've never said to them, what do you want to be when you grow up? I've never once asked because I want to, I think as a parent, show them options so they can see how I show up and live in this world. They see when we've gone to Kenya or India and help build a school, or they see when we volunteer at the food bank, like showing them experiences that we're blessed enough to be able to have that opens their eyes to what do they want to do to take advantage of their gifts that they might have to change the world, to be happy. So I, I, I don't give them ideas. I mean, even my oldest going to college, uh, she keeps asking me what university, what college she should go to. And I'm like, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Like, it's just giving ideas and thoughts, but it's her decision. Well, I think the other thing that I say to my kids too is we live in a challenging world, of course, yes. and every day more and more challenging, but we also live in a world where uh, you can change your mind, mm -hmm. right? And you didn't start out thinking that you were going to go and start this business that became this incredible business. Mm -hmm. And you probably didn't think about... Uh, starting a franchise business and and being mm -hmm. able to allow so many people to uh, build their own businesses through your dream, but mm -hmm. I think that that's the beauty of it is that every, it's everybody's journey, and I think mm -hmm. that that's the thing that I keep saying to my kids. It's like the the thing is you got to put a stake in the ground and go somewhere. And yeah, and people can change. People can, can change, change their mind about anything. I mean, people get married and change their minds. Like totally. it, you can make massive decisions, but if it doesn't work out, what did you learn? Totally. How do you show up in this world? And yeah, we're we're pretty blessed. The world's a challenging place, as we all know. But would we have it any other way? I mean, you and I would be bored silly if the world was easy, right? So true. So yeah. true. So, well, thank you so much, Brian. And thanks everybody thank for you, listening Kara. today. Definitely uh, have have a look out for BYOB, build your own business, be your own boss, Brian's book, which is coming out very soon and in pre-order. And thanks everybody for listening to the Kara Golden Show. We're here every Monday and Wednesday. Definitely give this episode five stars. It does make a difference in the algorithm mm -hmm. and subscribe and find me on all social channels at Kara Golden. Where do people find you, by the way, Brian? Brian Scudamore, just go to Google. I'll show up. Wonderful. And definitely uh, go to all of his companies um, and and use his companies, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, mm -hmm. WOW One Day Painting, and Shack Shine. And everybody have a great rest of the week. Thank you for listening.